historic charm, and youthful exuberance. There's the Mammoth House of Hope, an energy farm with 32,000 solar panels, and greens with a view at Harborside International Golf Center. But what makes Pullman a national treasure is its history. This is where John Pullman set out to transform American industry, but his story is as tragic as it is triumphant. Pullman had risen to fame after the sleeping car he manufactured was hitched to the funeral train for assassinated President Abraham Lincoln. The notoriety attracted investors and demand for Pullman's next generation of cars, dubbed Hotels on Wheels. The Pullman car was the epitome of luxury travel in the 19th century, and it put the town of Pullman on the map, literally. To ramp up production, George Pullman bought 4,000 acres near Lake Calumet in 1880 and built a company town, which he named for himself. Much of that town is still standing today. Homes of various sizes were rented to workers according to the employee's status. As with everything in his empire, the town was expected to earn a profit, and the Pullman Company controlled everything. The first resident moved into Pullman in January 1st of 1881. By 1884, there were over 6,000 people living here. That's Pullman resident Mike Shemansky. He's the president of the historic Pullman Foundation. And the idea was the people that came to work here would have good housing and all these amenities. And the amenities were fantastic. There was a Pullman-owned bank, a Pullman-owned shopping center called the Arcade, and a Pullman-owned Market Square where vendors rented space to sell their wares. The Florence Hotel was named for Pullman's favorite daughter. This was the only place in town where alcohol was served, and only to company managers and their guests. Pullman even built a church, but the rent was too high to attract a congregation for the first six years. Pullman believed his spotlessly clean town with its wholesome amenities would create a new kind of factory worker, one that was sober, hardworking, and company. And of course, if they're happy workers, they won't join a union, right? Well, there won't be a need to. I mean, and, and things went along fairly well, and it wasn't until the Great Recession, 1893-97, that uh, screwed things up. That was the start of big trouble in Pullman's paradise. To make ends meet, he cut workers' wages, but he didn't reduce the rent for workers' housing because he had guaranteed a profit to his investors. Pullman's employees walked out on strike on May 11, 1894. The American Railway Union, led by Eugene V. Debs, got workers across the country to refuse to operate trains with Pullman cars. Pullman refused to negotiate, and federal troops were called in to break the strike. Violence erupted and several workers were killed. Debs was jailed, the strike was broken, and Pullman reopened for business. But in the aftermath, the Federal Commission condemned Pullman for his actions. Three years later, George M. Pullman died of a heart attack. Many accounts say that his grave at Chicago's Graceland Cemetery was reinforced with steel and concrete out of fear that his body would be desecrated. He was the focus of a lot of hatred. Did he feel misunderstood? Oh, I'm sure he felt he was misunderstood. He was more of a person who wanted to provide people with opportunities and be a great capitalist. And he ended up between a rock and a hard place during the strike because on one hand he had responsibility to his stockholders, his bondholders, and he also felt some responsibility to the community that he had created. Why did the National Park Service name Pullman a national monument. The innovation of rail transportation, which Pullman was sort of the avant-garde on that. Also, the emergence of the labor movement. The third reason was the Pullman Porters, or the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. The Pullman Porters provided impeccable service for the palace cars. Many of the first generation had been slaves before emancipation. Their polish and gracious demeanor were legendary, but life for them behind the scenes was another story. Pullman porters worked under inhumane conditions, conditions that were not necessarily fair for the normal working class. That's David Peterson. I met him at the A. Philip Randolph Pullman Porters Museum, where he serves as president and executive director. You know, to think that someone would be on the road that long, on their feet, 
serving people and get four hours of sleep. That's just unrealistic. Where, where did they sleep? Majority of the time in the smoking car. So just imagine that, the four hours that you do have to, to, to sleep, you have to, you're inundated with smoke. Many passengers called every porter George after their omnipotent boss. Despite their lack of power in the company, Pullman porters were well respected in their community, seen as role models for their professionalism. But they wanted better working conditions. They were denied membership in all white railroad unions, so they formed their own, the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, led by A. Philip Randolph. The Attorney General characterized A. Philip Randolph in a certain way. Mm -hmm. What did he call him? He called him the most dangerous Negro in the United States. W what made him so dangerous? Well, there were uh, several accusations made about A. Philip Randolph. Uh, they called him a communist. They called him all different types of things. But at the end of the day, he was just someone who was concerned very, very passionately about the economic empowerment of the African-American community. It took 12 years, but the Pullman Company finally recognized the union in 1937. The struggle was for a contract, but it was for more than a contract, right? Absolutely. After they got that, that respect and they became the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, they saw this power. So, this, so the next thing was, okay, well, what, how can we help everybody else? It really becomes a, a big component of the civil rights movement. A. Philip Randolph and the Pullman Porters are the grandfathers of the civil rights movement. That's why today I'm designating Chicago's Pullman District as America's newest national monument. The Pullman Company stayed in business well into the 20th century. But demand for Pullman cars fell off with the decline in passenger rail travel. The company closed the plant in 1957 and the neighborhood began to deteriorate. Neighbors banded together to fight a plan to bulldoze all of Pullman in 1960, beginning a slow process of landmarking and restoration. In a heartbreaking setback, an arson fire destroyed much of the old factory, including its famous clock tower, on a cold December night in 1998. But the state has been rebuilding it, and the National Park Service plans to use it as a visitor's center for the National Monument. Today, there are encouraging signs as factories return to Pullman. This one plans to clean up. The Southside Soapbox. That's the nickname of San Francisco-based Method Soap's 22-acre Chicago plant that opened in 2015. At first glance, it looks like a rainbow. But the color that really stands out is green. A wind turbine and sun-tracking solar trees help power the plant that includes a 75,000 square foot greenhouse on the roof. From soap to suds, Pullman has gotten into the microbrew game with Argus Brewery. Producing beers with names like Iron Horse and Pegasus, this brewer is right at home in the historic Schlitz stables. Most amazingly of all, this 19th century model town is now being seen as a model town for the 21st century. A sustainable new town today. 90% of the same criteria would be used that Pullman used. It was a pedestrian scale community and it also had a wide variety of housing. By design, it was built to have a diverse community, uh, people of different incomes uh, living together. 